Dr. Philipp Auslander is on the faculty of the Georgia Tech and has been a professor in the School of Literature, Media and Communication since 1999. He holds the PhD in theater from Cornell University. And Dr. Auslander teaches primarily in the area of performance studies with particular interest in performance of music, performance and technology and the documentation of performance. He's a contributing editor to several journals in theater of performance, uh, in theater or performance studies based in the US or the UK. And he has published really extensively um, seven books, um, of which most known is Liveness, Performance in a Mediatized Culture, uh, which came out from uh, Rutledge in 1999, and its second edition uh, was published in 2008. He's also the editor of Performance Critical Concepts, a reference collection of uh, 89 essays in four volumes published by Rutledge in 2003. He's co-editor with uh, Carrie Sandal of Bodies in Commotion, Performance and Disability. Uh, which was published from University of Michigan Press in 2005. Dr. Auslander received numerous prestigious awards for his published scholarship. So, Philippe, welcome to our two question series, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and here are my two, my two questions Can performance be conserved? And if so, how? And if not, why? And what does it mean to conserve performance? Well, so first of all, my answer to the question, can performance be conserved is yes, I think it can. Um, I think the, the goal of conserving it is to make it available to people, audiences who have not had the opportunity uh, to experience it. Um, and, you know, in a way, I'm thinking of this in a, as parallel to conservation in other fields, such as conservation of a painting, uh, since the purpose of doing that is to keep the painting around and available for people to, to look at. Now, of course, it is different with performance because you don't necessarily have uh, an object such as you have with a painting that's still around, that's been around the whole time. Um, I think though that it, the answer to these kinds of questions differs a great deal according to what kind of performance you're talking about. Um, and I think that I can see sort of two different uh, possibilities. Uh, one has to do with what I would call the conservation of the work. And the other would have to do with the conservation of a specific iteration of that work. And I think that which is desirable, as I say, depends on what kind of performance you're talking about. So for example, if you're talking about, uh, you know, theater, opera, ballet, uh, things of that nature, then it's very possible that what we're actually interested in conserving is not the work itself, but rather some particular iteration of the work. So-and-so's Hamlet or this choreography of Swan Lake or, you know, whatever it might be. So it's not so much Hamlet or Swan Lake <laughs> that's being conserved as a particular uh, iteration, a particular performance of it. And so I think that that's one sort of set of possibilities. And obviously the kind of information that you have to uh, make available or put together uh, in order to be able to present enough information to someone so that they can have a sort of imaginative experience of what that performance was like uh, is considerable, I would say. I don't think though that it's necessarily as considerable as some people suggest, because as I've written myself, I mean, I do believe that you can derive a lot of information uh, if the goal is a kind of imaginative reconstruction for yourself of the performance. Uh, you, can, you can get pretty far down that road with not that much information. I mean, there's a, some photographs, you know, et cetera. You don't necessarily need to have uh, as much information about the performance, I don't think, um, as some people seem to suggest, in part because I think that, um, you know, there's more information contained, for example, in a fo still photograph uh, about what that performance was like than people often, I think, uh, allow for. Um, and then the second kind of uh, conservation or the second category of performance for me, it would be things like Flux's uh, performance, George Brecht scores, things like that, um, where 
the particular iterations are actually not that important in a sense uh, because those scores uh, are written or you know created uh, to be so open-ended in interpretation that there's you know <laughs> an infinitude of possibilities uh, of how to perform those pieces so the question of you know a, unless there's some reason to think that a particular performance is somehow definitive uh, or particularly interesting which also goes against the fluxus aesthetic to even think that way. Um, but okay, uh, unless there's re a reason such as that, then I think what, what one is trying to conserve is the work itself, right? The, the thing that, the matrix, the thing that gives rise to all of these different possible iterations. And obviously that's a relatively simple uh, possibility, although maybe not quite as simple as it might seem. So I recently wrote an essay on John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds, which uh, I think is another example of this kind of thing where, you know, any given iteration of that piece is by definition completely different from any other given iteration since its content is ambient sound. Um, and, and so again, in that sense, the particular uh, iterations of it, any given particular iteration is not of, of, of great interest in a sort of ongoing way. It's of great interest if you're there and experiencing it. But in terms of my goal of trying to create uh, an opportunity for someone who wasn't there to have an experience of the piece, it's not about the experience of a particular performance of that piece. It's about understanding what that piece is. And that you can do from the score, except <laughs> that in this particular case, there are actually three different scores. Um, and so, you know, sort of trying to figure out what the work is that's being conserved is not as straightforward um, as it might appear. And in fact, one of those scores is itself a work of conservation in a way, because uh, David Tudor, the pianist who premiered this piece, um, said that the original score that John Cage wrote uh, which he gave to David Tudor somehow got lost. And so David Tudor actually reconstructed it himself. And so there is a document, but it's a document of David Tudor's reconstruction of Cage's original document. Um, and then there are two subsequent scores that Cage published, which are different, uh, particularly different from the first one, the lost one. Um, so there's actually quite a lot to sort through. Uh, or to think about uh, in terms of just what the best way is of, uh, of conveying the nature of the work. But I do think in cases like that, uh, it is about the work and conserving the work and not so much about uh, conserving a particular performance of or iteration of the work. Now, in saying that, I am not in any way suggesting that particular performances are of no historical interest. I mean, I think it's very interesting and I did a little bit of this work for my essay uh, to look into, you know, just what that first performance uh, that David Tudor undertook in 1952, um, you know, just some of the circumstances involved in that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think that uh, there is definitely reason to be interested in specific iterations of the performance, but I would circle back to what I'm taking to be kind of the primary goal which is to give somebody the opportunity to imaginatively experience the work. And I think in a case like 433, you actually, that actually happens better uh, from conserving the work itself as opposed to conserving specific iterations of the work. We speak about the ontology of the work so that there is a work and there are its manifestations. And I wonder, you know, there is this entire trace history as well of works of art, such as props and relics yeah. and all sorts of things. W would they also belong to, to the work in some ways? And obviously I'm interested in it through the lens of conservation. So would keeping them be also, you know, conserving a performance? Just off the cuff, I would think that, you know, the sort of conservation of or preservation of physical artifacts um, associated with uh, a particular performance uh, is more kind of along the lines of the first possibility um, that I suggested uh, where, you know, the important thing is to conserve uh, a specific iteration of a performance. But if it's the work itself, then 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not, I mean, it's it's again interesting to know that you know, uh, 433 was first performed at this place near Woodstock, New York, which is a very bucolic mm -hmm. or you know, open air kind of. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it's open air, but it's in a very rural bucolic setting. Um, uh, it's a small concert hall. It still operates today. I mean, you can go and see it if you want to get a sense of that ambience. But again, that would help you to understand that event. But I don't necessarily think that understanding that event is the most important gesture in terms of conserving 433. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then you also mentioned that the reenactment or enactment, if we want to follow, you know, Rebecca Schneider, that everything is already a re. So an, an enactment, right, of, of those pieces, do you consider them also as a form of, it would belong perhaps to the to the first category, but it's somehow perhaps fluid category. Would you also, you know, consider them as, as a part of, of this conservation uh, process? I think reenactment, I will call it reenactment, because in the in the case of the first category, you know, if, if you uh, if you wanted to try to reenact a specific, you know, like David Tudor's performance of 433, I mean, you could go to the place where it was done, you know, et cetera. I mean, you could do this. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I see the value of that, um, however. Um, but enactment in a slightly different sense, I do see. I mean, the, and I think I, I don't know, I think my ideas and Rebecca Schneider are somewhere in the same universe here, although not exactly. But in the last part of, of my book on performance documentation, I do talk about this idea that, you know, if, if I, I mean, take something like 433, because it's a very simple example. If once I find out about a piece like that, or a Fluxus piece or something, I do have a kind of desire to do it for myself, right? And I think that that impulse is an important part of this as well. It's not just about, you know, having the opportunity to see the thing or to witness it or to see somebody else doing it. And I, you know, I think, you know, Rebecca has written about civil war reenactments and things like that. And there's a lot going on there. But part of it is this desire to, to feel it, to do it yourself, to know what that experience is like. Um, and so enactment or reenactment in that sense, and I don't think it's necessarily the case that you actually do it, but there's still the desire in some way to do it, right? Um, I don't necessarily have to you know, pretend that I'm <laughs> sitting still for four minutes and 33 seconds without, um, I can still sort of have, have the impulse to do that, right? And I think that's an important part of it too, is, is that, that sort of desire to know what it feels like to do something uh, and not, uh, not just uh, what it feels like, what it might have felt like uh, to have seen or witnessed something. Um, would the meaning of the conservation of performance lie in the very understanding what the work is? And if not just what it means, to conserve performance. In the case of 433, it's not absolutely clear what the work is, right? I mean, uh, I mean just as an example, and something I find really fascinating um, is that the original score that David Tudor reconstructed, he claims, was in 4-4 four, four time uh, with a tempo of 60. And and that's, that's not the case of any of the subsequent scores. There's no time signature and no indication of tempo. Um, so, you know, and, and to me, the idea of writing a piece that, you know, supposedly silent piece or blank score that nevertheless has a time signature and a tempo is fascinating. I mean, what is that exactly? Right? What, what is a performer supposed to do with that? Um, uh, and then the absence of those things in the subsequent scores, I think that, that raises some, yeah, it makes it very difficult in some ways to know what the work actually is. Um, but in that sense, it's, you know, it's endlessly fascinating <laughs> um, uh, to, uh, to think about it. And, 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 you know, and maybe just in very practical terms, in conservation terms, it means that in order to grasp the work in some sense, you have to have all three scores. You know? mm -hmm. um, that no one of them is really conveying to you what Cage was trying to do or get at, or I don't really want to, you know, get into intentionality, but uh, and, and again, it's not clear in a lot of ways. I mean, that, that piece is much more obscure than it appears to be. 
Um, so whatever his intent, he, there are stated intentions and people have attributed intentions to him. But if you actually just look at those three documents, the intentions in certain ways are relatively fuzzy. Um, uh, and the documents are relatively inconsistent uh, in certain respects. And so, you know, yeah, if you have all three, then you maybe have something to kind of ponder in terms of what is this thing and how is it supposed to work um, and, and, and go from there kind of, uh, as opposed to, you know, any one of them, which, which would give you a particular impression that would be different from having all three of them. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not, I mean, I do, you're absolutely right to say that I do stick with a kind of model of, you know, work as if that's something that exists and, um, that gives rise to iterations, right? Um, yes, uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean I necessarily think that the thing called the work is straightforwardly identifiable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that depends a lot on uh, exactly what it is and uh, the particular case. It's it's brilliant because actually it brings me to you know to to the conclusion that also conservate what conservation is or might be in relation to performance is something also very multivalent and very dependent you know on how we conceive yeah. of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to go back to where I started, I mean, I think if your goal is to conserve, you know, a specific event, a specific performance of something, then yeah, I mean, how you would go about that, the kinds of materials you would try to amass. And the relationships among them you would try to construct, perhaps, and the picture you would try to create out of all that um, would be, I think, quite different uh, from the cases like, you know, to me, fluxes, cage, you know, various other things, um, where the particular iterations of the work are, I think, less important uh, if, in terms of kind of long term understanding or the ability to you know, experience the piece in some way. Um, than really trying to amass data about specific iterations of it. I do want to say, just as a footnote to all that, that uh, another thing in terms of my little bit of research into 433 that I did find interesting is that um, uh, there is a tendency on, the, on, on some people's parts to treat David Tudor's performance as sort of the definitive one and to chastise subsequent versions for not doing what he did basically mm -hmm. um, and um, which I find really interesting especially in the context of how far away from the spirit of Cage and Tudor uh, that kind of notion of a canonical way of performing um, uh, is but it happened anyway so mm -hmm. Wonderful, which which brings us obviously to this, you know, to this notion of originality or authenticity is so often uh, followed in, in the field of conservation or museum studies or, or even art history that there is some kind of originating event which is, you know, right. higher, highly valued in comparison with, with any other that follows. But um, yes, Philip, thank you so very, very much. Uh,